Hello, thank you, and welcome to All About Preprints. My name is A.P. Anderson. I'm a research and instruction librarian at Velma K. Waters Library. Let's talk about preprints. First of all, let's get a definition of what they are. This is going to be kind of a, a very specific technical workshop. Preprints are an important publishing format in a lot of different fields. They're really kind of uh, popular or prevalent in the sciences, but all of the disciplines uh, have something that is like this. And so you'll probably see them by a lot of different names, depending on what discipline that you're looking at. Basically, what a preprint is, is it is an article that has been shared with the world prior to being accepted and published in an academic journal. These are not typically peer-reviewed in a formal way, although there is something of a peer review light process, more on that later. It's not formal peer review. And they're shared online and are typically open access. Some of the names can get a little bit confusing, especially the term ePrint early on in the process when online journal articles were really getting started and Preprints were getting started as well. Eprints and preprints kind of were synonyms, but now they've kind of diverged a little bit. And sometimes eprint can refer to something completely different, uh, which is an article rather than at the very beginning of its life cycle, kind of closer towards you know the the end. Uh, something that has already been published in a journal, usually one that is with a paywall, and it has passed through its period of time where its publisher has exclusive rights to share it, and the author author is allowed to share it themselves, uh, typically in an institutional repository such as Tamu C's Digital Commons. Uh, an author can upload their work and share it open access that way. You will sometimes see people refer to uh, a preprint as an ePrint still today though. So to understand what is the big deal about preprints, it's a good idea to look at just an overview of how the academic publishing world works in general and where preprints fit into the process. Typically how this works is if an author wants to submit to a journal, they will write their article and send it on and make sure that the journal is publishing in something that fits their field. And then the journal will look at their submission and make sure, yes, this, this fits the kind of scope of thing that we publish. And they'll send it on to a group of peer reviewers who are in the same field as whatever discipline the journal publishes in, the author's peers, and they will make sure that it is scientifically or methodologically sound, making sure that it is up to the standards of the discipline, that it's not plagiarized, that the, the content of it is going to be valuable to the field, and they'll often make comments on that manuscript, send it back to the journal, who will send it back to the author, who will do rewrites, and then send it back to the journal, and then send it back to the reviewers. This part of the process can happen several times, with the manuscript getting refined a little bit again and again, uh, until the point that you know the re reviewers decide, yes, this is okay for us to publish. Sometimes they never decide that it's okay to publish and they reject the submission, but there can be, it, it's not a yes or no decision. Sometimes there is a revision process in the middle and that can take a while. Uh, sometimes if there is an article that requires a lot of revisions before publication, this can last months uh, or even a year. That is where preprints tend to come in. So an author who wants to share their work as a preprint will often send it to a preprint server first or even simultaneously to the journal. Once it has been sent to the preprint hosting server, the people that run the server will look at it and they're not peer reviewing it. They're not making sure that it is up to the standards of the field because a lot of preprint servers cover a lot of different disciplines. Some are more focused, but a lot of them will be all of the sciences or all of medicine, all of the humanities. And they'll, they'll just make sure uh, more of a quick verification sort of thing. Is this decent enough for us to share on our site? If so, yes, we're going to go ahead and send it. They're not checking for the same level of detail as peer review, but they will publish it on their server and it is at that point available to the public. And this is where it gets kind of cool because once it is shared with the public, the public who tend to be other scholars writing in a similar field are able to give that author feedback. The revision process happens much more quickly 
with something that is shared in a preprint. Often authors will revise and resubmit fairly rapidly, uh, taking feedback into account. Sometimes they'll end up collaborating with, you know, people that are also on the preprint server. And then what ends up happening is if they have waited to this point to submit to the journal, they can do that then. And if they have gotten some really good feedback from other people on the preprint server, then they often have a smoother time once they get to the actual peer review stage. There's less that the peer reviewers need them to fix, and it makes the traditional peer review publishing process go a little faster. There are lots of issues in academic publishing in general, that could be a whole workshop by itself. But preprints seek to address some of the concerns that can arise in traditional publishing. For example, if you are writing in a field where the, the research is very time sensitive, having to wait after you've done all of the research and written the article, drawn your conclusions, waiting months to a year to then get it shared with the world can be very detrimental to the uh, exchange of scientific ideas. Uh, this was something that happened uh, a lot during the COVID-19 uh, early days. People would share early research in preprint servers so that the most cutting edge developments could be shared with other researchers and collaboration could happen in essentially real time. And then also you have a situation where if you're publishing to a journal that has a paywall, then your research is going to be limited in its reach for a year or 18 months, even after publication before the whole world gets it. Also, there tends to be an issue since there is a finite number of journal articles that a, a journal can publish for any given volume and issue. Sometimes the priority tends to be towards research that is deemed important, which can be a, a, a nuanced definition of what important means. Often it means something that challenges a notion in the field, uh, it's groundbreaking research. It does something dramatic, but research that merely, or I don't want to say merely because that feels like it's devaluing it, work that confirms existing ideas, that repeats experiments that have already been done, proving that they can be replicated, which is one of the major steps in the scientific process, those are not articles that tend to be as high priority to publish. But with a preprint server, there isn't a limit to how many articles can be shared at any one time. As long as they meet the standards of the server administrators and editors, it can get shared and it doesn't matter how many other similar articles are shared at the same time as long as things aren't being directly plagiarized. And that kind of background research can be very valuable to other researchers working in that same field because they can then look and see there is a huge body of evidence to support this one concept and then they can build on that. Whereas otherwise, the stuff that's less exciting might not ever see daylight. Uh, there are also issues with uh, the open access model in traditional academic publishing. Many, even, even reputable non-predatory journals that publish open access have to charge fees in order to publish and then make it those articles available to the public at large just to cover costs. But that money has to come from somewhere. And so many authors are in a position of, well, do I publish for free knowing that people can't see my article? Or do I take on extra cost and let it be seen by everyone? Whereas preprint sharing kind of takes that issue out of play at least a little bit. So moving on, I want to talk about some preprint servers that are out there. To start, all of these tend to be pronounced about the same way. Uh, Archive, A-R-X-I-V, uh, was the original preprint server. Uh, it started with physics, and then all of the other servers or most of the other servers that have come after that following in its footsteps have also kind of followed along with its naming convention. It makes it kind of hard to say it out loud. Yes, so Archive, they have them for a whole bunch of different disciplines. Many of them are through OSF, which is a uh, platform that has the infrastructure for the preprint sharing. And if they are done through OSF, then OSF has a uh, preprint search tool to allow users to search like 30 of their servers at once. Uh, otherwise, you have to jump in and, and search them one by one or use a library catalog search. 
research. There are some journal publishers that are getting in on this. For example, Sage is a, a journal publisher, but it also has a preprint community for the humanities and social sciences. Just as a note, I said earlier that the, the, the physical sciences were the first adopters of preprints, but uh, humanities, social sciences, and arts are actually getting into this as well. It's there, That has not been established in those disciplines for as long, but I can imagine that in the future it will become a lot more common. So for anything like this, there are going to be some benefits and there are going to be some drawbacks. And I'm going to talk about it first for researchers and readers, people who might be wanting to consider preprints as an option to cite in their own literature reviews, background research, papers. There are a lot of things that are good about preprints. They are open access. As I said before, researchers can collaborate with each other and build on each other's work, and they can get access to the research that kind of lays a foundation without necessarily being groundbreaking. However, the lack of peer review can be a problem. There are articles that will make it onto preprint servers uh, that are not correct, that have information in them that is based on faulty science or the, the conclusions are skewed. And the hope is that the community feedback will help address that. But it isn't the same thing as going through formal peer review with the publish or don't publish binary decision. However, that said, not every academic journal that publishes using the traditional mo model uses peer review either. So it's not necessarily comparing preprints to academic publishing as a whole, so much as it is comparing it to journals that use the peer review model. There also have been issues with journals uh, and funding organizations not counting preprints as valid sources. Uh, back in 2019, there was a, a, an issue where a funding organization out of Australia uh, denied grant applications to a lot of researchers because they had been citing preprints in their research rather than published articles. This is not super common anymore. This is also a thing with if you're applying for a grant and you need to put your own work into your curriculum vitae as part of the grant application process. Some of them will specify whether you can include unpublished manuscripts or not in that. More on that on the next slide, but that all kind of ties in together about not every organization considers these high enough quality or standard as a regular journal article. And then finally, sometimes there will be multiple versions of an article that go through all of these different iterations of editing, refining, and rewriting. Writing. And like researchers have to be very clear, like which version of it they're looking at, because if an article has gone on to be published somewhere else and it has had significant rewrites in the peer review process, you might not be able to tell that by looking at its place where it was originally shared as a preprint, especially if the published journal article is behind a paywall. So there might be updates that you aren't able to see until that exclusivity period ends. Uh, and, you know, if the researcher is willing or able to share that article as an an e-print or a post-print in some sort of open access variety. Uh, I'd also like to say that there is a, a thing that happens sometimes in the wider world, even outside of academia, in the world of journalism, where uh, specifically science journalism, there are those uh, news articles and news stories that will run that's like, researchers have discovered this incredible new thing that will make your health way better if you just eat this one supplement uh, a lot of the time. What happens typically with those, nowadays at least, is that the science journalists are looking at these preprint servers and they're looking for groundbreaking research that's publicly available and open access that they can then build a story off of. That doesn't necessarily mean anything about the credibility of the preprint, but it is a thing to keep in mind if you're reading articles from science journalism sites to know that they might not be pulling this information from peer-reviewed journals. This might be just the very early preliminary stages of research into a study uh, that's still getting feedback from others in that research community. The, the science journalism doesn't necessarily always make that very clear. It kind of can make it sound like this is the final version of a study and these are their final conclusions when things are a little bit more undefined at that point and still being uh, examined. So authors, people who are wanting to publish their own work, there are considerations too about 
whether they should share it as a preprint first or if they should go right ahead to the journal submission process. Time is a huge consideration, especially again in those fields where timeliness is very important, especially if it's a situation where an author might be discovering something new. Like if, if their work is groundbreaking and they are about to find the cure for cancer, do they want to wait six months to a year to get that published? Published, and then a year to 18 months having that behind a paywall? Or do they want to share that with their community right now? Uh, we talked a little bit about how the feedback period can make peer review smoother, but also there is the, the fact that a lot of these servers, uh, preprint servers, are made discoverable by search tools. The Waters Library Catalog can search archive for computer science preprints. Google Scholar can search a lot of these too. And that means these are being seen by more and more people, even outside of major institutions. Taking, for example, the case of a researcher who has uh, a, like an earth-shattering discovery that they're wanting to write on, this is, the, the time factor is also an issue here too, because uh, there's a concept in you know, the, the world of scientific discovery, the idea of establishing priority, proving that you are the first person to discover that thing or study this thing in that way, or you're the first one to come up with this theory. And for issues where maybe several researchers might come up with similar conclusions at around the same time, you know, the, a matter of a few days might mean the difference between getting something named after you that will be studied in textbooks for, you know, a century to come, or being the second person to discover it who doesn't get their name remembered. And so that's an issue where time is of the essence. And if you share your work as a preprint, there is a stamp on it that says this is where you, you shared your content. For U.S. copyright law, a work is considered to have copyright protection even if it's not officially registered with uh, the U.S. Copyright Office. It's considered to be your work if it exists in some tangible form, and you have intellectual property rights over it. Having it be on a preprint server is a really great way of proving that not only is this your intellectual property, but you got there first. And then on the issue we mentioned earlier about funding organizations, many of these preprint servers will assign a DOI number, digital object identifying number, uh, to a preprint, which authors can then take that little URL and attach it to their grant proposal, their CV, uh, give to a, a promotion or tenure committee, and say, look, I have been doing research. Here is my preprint. It hasn't been published yet, but you can go look at the article. It is online. Here is a URL. Whereas if they're not sharing it publicly, they would have to wait until it has already been published to do that. Caveat, there are some issues with journal publication as the next step after sharing something as a preprint. There are a few journals that don't want to publish articles that have appeared previously as preprints. This is not as common as it used to be. When preprints were first coming out, authors often had to make the choice do I want to share this as a preprint or do I have to publish it? Nowadays, most publishers are seeing the value in integrating a preprint into the, the sort of workflow of, of the publishing ecosystem, but it's always a good idea to be very clear about the policies of a journal that you want to apply to before you uh, go ahead and submit your manuscript. Uh, there's also a fear of scooping uh, or plagiarism, which is uh, the idea that if you share your work as a preprint, somebody else might take credit for the thing that you have shared, and then they go on to be the one to share that in a peer-reviewed journal format, and it, it's a whole thing. So there is a risk of that, and I don't want to say that there isn't, but you also have intellectual property rights and the ability to prove that you shared something first. So there, the, the DOI number and the priority aspect can actually be a, a mitigating factor protecting you from having somebody else scoop your discovery. However, there is the issue that peer-reviewed journal articles are seen as more credible than preprints, and it's just a big hassle if somebody decides that they want to do this to you. Now, I am gonna say that that scooping this and taking it without credit is a, a, an ethics violation. This is not something that should be done. That's that's bad behavior on the, the part of the second author and not something that most journals would tolerate because it's 
basically tantamount to a, you know, plagiarism, but it's still a hassle that the primary author would have to go through. So with that said, thank you for attending today. I wanted to remind you that anytime you need help with your research, whether this is uh, as a student, a faculty member, or a staff member, please feel free to reach out to your research and instruction team at Velma K. Waters. That email address is uh, a shared email. So if you email it to, to that email address, you'll get all of us. Uh, we can help you talk through issues of you know your research or provide scholarly communication assistance to people that are prospective authors for their own work. And you can reach out to us to meet with us in person by email or Zoom. If you're an instructor, we can also come to your class and talk to your students about this kind of stuff. Thank you guys so much for attending today. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Have a great day.